Hi everyone and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. On the show with me today I have a returning guest and a brand new guest I'm very excited to speak to. Uh, first up the new guest I've got Kelly Chase. You will know her as the creator and host of the UFO Rabbit Hole Podcast and of course co-founder of Ontocalypse Productions. Hi to Kelly. Hi Andy I'm thrilled to be here thanks for having me. Wonderful to have you. I've not done the two guest thing for a while, so I'm like, I'm going to, yeah, I've said hi to you now. I'm going to speak to, you know, old hat now. Jay's done this a few times. I've got Jay Christopher King, director of the Experiencer Group and co-founder of Untalklipse Productions as well. A man of many hats, much like Kelly is these days with many, many, you know, rings in the fire, however you want to say it. Jay, welcome back. Great to be here. Great to be back, Andy. Uh, thanks so much for having me. And uh, it's wonderful to see Kelly and Andy here. This is fantastic. You see Kelly a lot uh, more often than I do, um, obviously being over in the States and and working together. And that working together is one of the reasons I want to get you both on to speak. Um, you are, of course, both speakers at this year's Contact in the Desert. We'll get to that at the end of the show. Ticket links are in the description and all that good stuff. Um, but first up, uh, quick intros for you from you both. For anyone who may not be familiar with either of you from either previous uh, appearances like Jay or Kelly, if someone's listening or watching, many will know you from from your own work on the uh, UFO Rabbit Hole podcast. But please, Kelly, first, um, a little bit about yourself and, and what brings you to the UFO dance. Yeah, so um, like you said, I'm the host of the UFO Rabbit Hole. I've been doing that for a few years now. It's been an incredible ride. Um, you know, just becoming a part of this UFO community, I, I came in, as I've shared on my show a lot, as a skeptic um, and have become more than a believer. Um, this has become my whole life and I'm, I'm thrilled to be doing it. Um, and I'm also, as you mentioned, the co-founder of Ontacalypse Productions, which I'm sure we'll talk about some more that I co-founded along with um, Jay and our uh, good friend and CFO of the company, uh, Jordan Flowers, who's a really bright and interesting guy in his own right. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm just really kind of diving into the media side of things in this in this ufology world. And I'm, I'm excited to talk about some of the stuff we've been working on. Definitely. And uh, that media stuff and the production side of things we are going to get to because it's a really interesting thing uh, for me, especially. Uh, I've got a slight media background, nothing like yourself or, or Jay's and many others, but I've got a big interest in that and, and that side of the UFO and related phenomena, that conversation. Um, but Jay, uh, before we get to that, a little bit about yourself or anyone unfamiliar with you and your work. Sure. Um well, as you stated, I'm the director of the Experiencer Group, which is a group that I co-founded um, back kind of in 2020, kind of in 2021. Our custom-built website went up in 20, early 2021. The Experiencer Group is a private pay-what-you-wish member site uh, dedicated to support, curiosity, and community for those who've lived through anomalous events of any and all kinds. So that's not just UFO, UIP experiencers or NHI experiencers. It could be anybody that's maybe experienced what people think of as haunting, out of body, near death experiences, precognitive dreams, any anything along those lines. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful place for me, partially because it's my sandbox and I built it, right? So of course it's gonna be awesome for me. But like, I, I really enjoy that the way that members approach it and approach each other on the site and they really do compare notes. There's there are now a lot of member groups that have grown up without me even having to necessarily be involved. There's a new group, for example, called Anomalous Anonymous, which I love, which is for for the for people that have had substance abuse and chemical dependency issues, uh, partially arising from the the incongruities that happen uh, between day to day life and their anomalous experiences. Mm. I mean, it's a very common. Uh, problem that uh, comes up often in groups um, that people have had substance abuse issues after surviving and going through anomalous experiences. So it's wonderful to see that. Book clubs, women's groups, uh, Ask Me Anything sessions, the private site. It's a lot of fun. And then, of course, uh, uh, after that, I started working on a series of conferences with James Ian Doley, and then Leslie Kane got involved with that as well, called Inquire Anomalous. So those inquiry conferences have been have been happening in New York City and online as a hybrid event. Uh, we had our fourth one in December. Uh, it was great. The in-person tickets sell out every single time and it happens faster and faster. And I have to apologize to people uh, when they don't see that the conference is happening. 
um, because it happened, it, they sell out so quickly. Um, but that's been, that's been a fun wild ride. And now, uh, I'm working with Kelly and Jordan flowers on on productions. And, um, it's been absolutely incredible. It's, it's a, it's a wonderful year to be kind of charting this path with Kelly and Jordan and others that are involved with the, sh- the upcoming series that we're working on. And I'm really looking forward to it. You mentioned James Eindoli. I texted him earlier today, actually, a few times back and forward. So uh, hello to James if he, if he gets a chance to catch this one up. Um, those conferences we'll, we'll mention later on uh, in New York. You've hosted real torchbearers for the subject. And I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass, as Americans like to say. Um, they <laughs> are. And I think it's something that's going to be really relevant to, to some of the work we're going to discuss with you. Not been able to get to one of those myself yet. Very close on one occasion stop holding them around christmas time you know for those of us who have young children <laughs> true. Um, you're right yeah that's um for those traveling it's a pain but listen let's talk about the creation of on productions if anyone's listening to this and thinks oh let's hear about the experience or group and, and whatnot jay and i have covered that on on previous podcasts including hosting several of the experiencers themselves on a variety of shows um so if you're interested search jay's name search experiencer group in the podcast search bar and you'll find those chats and conversations. Same on Kelly's pod. She's hosted G on multiple occasions as well. So you can certainly check those out and we won't run over too much old ground. Um, but we do have some listener questions around that sort of stuff later on. Um, so cool. Kelly, back to yourself. Um, on Talkalypse Productions, uh, a media production group from yourself, Jay and Jordan, as you mentioned, what was the thinking? How has this come about? Um, let's let's share this with the listeners. Absolutely. So Um, It came together kind of magically, as things often do when you're doing this kind of work. Um, There were kind of a group of us, um, most in the New York area. I came in from Ohio, um, but who back over the summer, we were there were so many people kind of with the, you know, the whistleblower revelations and the hearings and everything that there were people, you know, younger people, kind of our generation in the community who were like, okay, so what do we do? Like, what's, what's the next step and how do we contribute and how do we support this movement? And so um, Jordan Flowers ended up having a bunch of us who were kind of similarly minded. There were like maybe eight to 10 of us out to his house in Connecticut. And we spent a weekend just kind of sharing ideas and, you know, spitballing and whiteboarding and, and kind of out of that, me and Jordan and Jay found a really natural alignment in both kind of our vision for what we wanted to accomplish in the field. And also we have really naturally aligning skill sets. You know, Jay is an experienced director and has all of, you know, the amazing contacts that he has in the community and, you know, his the experiencer group. And, you know, I'm definitely more of kind of like a writer and a storyteller. And, you know, my community is mostly more people who are coming to this, um, coming to this field more in the last few years and are kind of looking for that on-ramp and are looking for credible information. And so like that felt like a really smart partnership to make. And then Jordan is, he's our money guy. And, uh, you know, Jordan Mm -hmm. is somebody who, um, from day one was like, you know, if people are going to make it in this field, like th- there seems to be this almost stigma around making money in this field, which is crazy. Cause then the alternative is that the only people who are working in this peel- field are people who are independently wealthier, you know, maybe being funded in some ways that might be a little secretive. And, you know, if we want independent researchers to grow up in this field and to build the, you know, ufology of the future, we need people to be able to make money in this field. And so Jordan is somebody who's got a great background, um, in business. He was ex McKinsey and did a bunch of other really interesting things and an entrepreneur himself. And so the three of us came together and we formed um, Ontocalypse Productions. We, the name itself comes from, you know, this conversation that's been a conversation we were having a lot, but is also happening in the community all the time around, you know, ontological shock. And I think the thing that we really wanted the name to capture is that this, the revelations that are coming out of Washington, you know, plus out of, you know, the scientific world and the philosophical world and kind of across the board is that we're moving into this space where we're realizing that it's not just ontological shock that we're going to be dealing with, but really kind of an ontological apocalypse where, you know, so many things that we believed about the world to be true turn out to not be quite as we were told. And so, you know, we really wanted to create media that speaks to that 
problem and that gives people an answer and a way forward and a way to not just like demand answers from Washington, which is, you know, a very important part of this, but really to find a step forward where like, like, how do I integrate this into my own life? How do I make sense of it? How do I move forward when I still have a job and maybe kids and all other things going on? Like, how do I integrate this and metabolize this information? So, um, so we just moved from there. We're starting with the docu series. We um, were lucky to do a very successful fundraising round on that with some fantastic investors who stepped up to the plate for us. Um, and magically, kind of some incredible collaborators have come to the table to work with us. Um, one in particular I like to shout shout out is um, Mike Rubino, who is a Hollywood film score composer who has worked with like Disney and DreamWorks and you know, everyone you can think of under the sun. And, um, you know, he's going to do be doing like a bespoke film score for us. Uh, and we could not afford him, uh, but he's very generously doing it for what we can afford. And um, it's been really magical and it's been, it's been so fun and it's really coming together and we have some amazing names. We started filming out at Seoul to begin with. We've got, um, we have Jeff Kripal who's come on as a consulting producer and is also featured. Um, Whitley Strieber, Diana Pasulka, Mike Masters, um, Alex Dietrich, the name, the list kind of goes on and on. And it's been, it's been a magical, it's been, been a magical ride. Certainly sounds it. Do you want to come in on that, Jay, and uh, expand at all or get uh, any input on your, your part? Yeah, sure. A magical ride indeed. Um, it's, it's interesting when you, when you take on a situation like this, because as as I'm sure you know, Andy, there's an aspect to ufology and anomalous studies in general that that takes place online, and mm -hmm. it's a huge part of it. It's it's the community aspect. It's where people chat about things. Um, but we know we all know that we can't get all of our information just from YouTube videos or from some random person that sounds like a transformer on Twitter or something like that, right? Uh, we have to go farther than that. And so then people start approaching the books, you know, and, and approaching the documentaries that have already exist in the space. But then as people that actually work on these projects and have boots on the ground, that's a different level as well. And so, you know, as uh, your wonderful showmate Dan uh, experienced down in Colombia, you know, and Vinny, um, having boots on the ground in, in situations like this produces a kind of accelerant and a kind of growth that can't happen when you're sitting in your living room or it, it can't for most people. Right. And so mm -hmm. I, I have a, a years of TV experience in the past and there's an aspect where in the past, the shows that I was working on, it's fun. And there's a, like, there's like an 80 to 90 hour a week kind of regular pace that happens in a lot of TV shows. And so there's a lot of work hard, play hard. And there's a lot, there's aspects where it can feel like a traveling circus and mm -hmm. like a surgical strike team at the same time. And one thing that I was really excited about with on talk flips was being able to, to pace our shoots partially for budgetary concerns, but also pacing our shoots so that we could go out, really experience something together and then kind of go back to our corners and process like what we'd just gotten and then kind of move it forward more as an experience and more as like a conversation between like Kelly and I, for example, and the on cam the other on camera talent that she mentioned. And then and also bring in the viewer for that in terms of like, how does it feel to be in these situations and how, how does it feel to be uh, to have boots on the ground in a situation like this? So we 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 definitely aspire to have that be an aspect that comes across on screen and we're looking forward to that that that's good to hear i think the ufo topic and i'm going to stop saying and associated phenomenon but that can be implied okay so the ufo topic the representation in the mainstream when it comes to this being presented you know as fact as reality and documentaries series and, and whatnot even news reports is extremely mixed and I would say more often than not, falls flat in its face for whatever reason that might happen. I think there's a few examples of that. Um, James Fox's documentaries, many would say are the standard bearer for, for that sort of stuff. But I think there's a whole lot more losses and wins. So from your point of view, Kelly, I'll come to you first. What are you hoping Antocalypse can bring 
that does the topic and the conversation justice and also add something that little bit different? I love this question, Andy. I really do. And um, be because this is definitely how we've been thinking things through. I think you kind of, if you don't have a reason to do it, like if you don't have an I something that you want to create that doesn't already exist. Like if someone else is already doing it, like if James Fox is already doing it and he's doing it better, like let James Fox do it. Right. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and I think that we really did feel like we had a space to speak into here. That was unique. Um, one of the things that I think is really exciting about the project that we're working on is that, um, is that Jay and I have kind of a unique perspective where, you know, we're Jay and I talk even before this, Jay and I talk basically every day and now it's even more so, but, you know, Jay has, we, we both have these online communities and, you know, with Jay's, ex, with Jay's community, he's talking to people often who are like having, you know, anomalous experiences for the first time or who are suddenly becoming aware of kind of this version of reality um, and recognizing that things in their past that they had forgotten or shoved back in a corner somewhere, just like not refused to look at, like now they have the context to begin to examine those things and they're looking for support. You know, and I'm kind of on the other end of the spectrum where, you know, I created my podcast because I did the same thing when I came into podcasting. I was already a huge fan of uh, that UFO show. Like, I love you guys so much. And I love the people who are already in the field. I was a, a fan of Somewhere in the Skies and, you know, the, the podcasts are already out there. I wanted to do something a little bit different because otherwise why do it, right? And so like my yeah. path has always been, I wanted to create the on-ramp, you know, so that, that for people who are newer to the field, so then they can graduate you know, to the other podcasts mm. when once they've figured out, you know, kind of gotten a lay of the land, right? And so a lot of people that come to me through my podcast are newer to the subject and they're just figuring this stuff out. And so, but I think what that gave us was like a really interesting starting place where we realized that by nature of just the way these things work, so many of the media projects that are, that have been out there so far, and there's so many amazing ones, obviously, you know, James Fox and, you know, Leslie Kane's UFOs investigating the unknown and, you know, unidentified and so many of these other kind of fantastic programs that have been put out there. A lot of them are just because of where we were in the conversation at the time, uh, were about, you know, making the case that we should even be talking about UFOs at all. You know, like that there's, there's a there there, as we say, and that this is real and that there's, that this is of note and that we should care. Um, and we really kind of wanted to start at a place where we begin very, at the very beginning of episode one of like, this is real, this is happening. And so now what? And then the, the, the series really dives into that question and speaks directly to the the questions and the anxieties, um, you know, and kind of the emergent amazingness and beauty that comes out of people stepping into that question in their own lives. And so, you know, we want to approach it from a few different angles. We want to talk through, we, we want to really center experiencers because so often when we're trying to make the case that we should just even be allowed to talk about this, we end up kind of marginalizing experiencer voices because you don't want to like spook the horse and scare people too much, like right out of the gate. But when you're starting with the premise that this is real, suddenly that opens up a door. And so we want to be, you know, really centering experience or narratives. We want to be talking with people who are really on the leading edge of this, you know, people like Jeff Kripal, people like um, James Madden, who's a philosopher whose book we published, Unidentified Flying Hyper Object, um, back a few months ago, um, that's really already being hailed as a new classic of the field. You know, these people who are having really interesting bleeding edge thoughts about what this could be. Um, and, you know, and we are going to look at like the government secrecy and stuff too. You know, we have um, Daniel Elizondo, whose work I think, you know, we're huge fans of, you know, who put out Loose Threads um, a while ago that was a really phenomenal piece of research, maybe one of the best that's been done in recent decades. Um, so we have him and um, James Iandoli uh, uh, also, you know, is coming to the table. And, you know, so we have, we're going to be exploring that side of things as well. And so um, I think we're just excited to have kind of a breadth and a depth of conversation that hasn't necessarily been had before, at least kind of at this sort of elevated, we're also trying to bring it to kind of an elevated level where it's not just, you know, as fun as it is to just wildly speculate. And, you know, Jay was just here and we like to stay up late and talk about all kinds of stuff. You know, we want to ultimately be able to ground the things that we're putting out there in like, yeah. you know, these people have PhDs and here's what they think. <laughs> so, so we're trying to really balance all of that and create something that brings something new to the table. 
And just, uh, you never mentioned the name of the series previously and the one you've mentioned, it's uh, The Beyond, UFOs, A New Reality. Still yes. the correct title, yeah, nothing's changed, we're, we're going with that, yeah. Yes, and cool. thank you for catching that. Yes, The Beyond. Everyone's going to be sick of hearing about it in a few months, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> in a good way, in a good way, hopefully, um, yes. that, it, that it blows up and goes big. And and I think you're right in a lot of what you said there. The, that conversation I'll probably come back to in terms of experiencers. And Jay, you know, we've talked about that before and we disagreed online a little while ago slightly on that approach. But that one thing that's missing massively in this whole topic is people being able to talk and disagree, but, you know, still talk to each other and not fall out and actually have a conversation and move forward because it'd be very very boring and i'm sure that's not how all your meetings have gone for talk clips where you jordan and jay have sat and went yes great idea yes great idea sometimes it's not a great idea sometimes it, i get what you're thinking but it's not right just now and you move on to something else but maybe a seed gets grown there and blooms into a different idea which which works and is an amalgamation of everyone else's thoughts so i think that's just missing from society in general before i get on my soapbox um but we'll come back to, to that side of things. And, and Jay, similar question to yourself from what Kelly said there, but for you, what, with years of experience in TV, you've, you've talked to me about that before in, on previous interviews. What do you think does work when you're approaching this sort of, you know, this sort of media for the UFO topic and, and what doesn't, what are you going to try and avoid? That's a great question. And we've thought a lot about it. And like, Partially like what Kelly was talking about, you know, centering experiencers is important, partially because the stories are so dang good. You know, you mm. get such amazing stories, like being able to pick through so many wonderful accounts, so many cases. You know, we went down to the archives of the impossible and got to, you know, actually handle the communion letters and, and other docs like this and being able to really look at at some underknown cases. And so a lot of the cases that we're going to be covering on the show aren't, it's not a greatest hits. I think that's one thing that the media landscape has done too much of. Mm. And it's like every, you know, each new show comes up and they, they're all great in their own ways. And they really are, you know, like I loved, I really enjoyed Encounters. I thought it was really well produced. And then, you know, at the same time you watch, you know, an episode comes up and I'm like, you know, I know the aerial, and so you know, I know, like I saw Randy Nickerson's movie. I already know this case. You know, there's other examples where it's like I remember the old John Mack archival footage. I know, I know this case. I don't need to see this case again. And like, yeah, there's a, there's an aspect where we're bringing in a new audience each time a sure. show like that comes out. And at the same time, then I'm so used to getting online, and then you know the the fifty to one hundred thousand people that kind of surround this community are all kind of you know, mit, you know, moaning, <laughs> and groaning about, about having seen the same stories. So we're going to be bringing in some, some more obscure cases that have really amazing qualities to them. We're going to be looking at, we're, we're doing a boots on the ground uh, situation that is kind of a through line through, through the whole project that covers an experience or family and a paranormal ranch that's never been talked about on camera before. That's going to be fascinating. And another aspect that, that we're bringing in here is that we were looking at what, and I want to, I want to handle this kind of in a delicate way because it, it deserves to be talked about in a delicate way, despite the, the, the contingent that we're talking about here is that we're talking about paranormal situations. We're talking about UFO, UIP, uh, and anomalous experience in general. We're talking, we're looking at kind of this broad landscape of anomalous experience and centering UFOs and UAPs. And that conversation for many years now has been a military, uh, like a military focused conversation. Uh, like ever since the days of like Donald Kehoe, you know, and everyone after that, and like, you know, NICAP and, and APRO and so many, so many situations and so many UFO groups were really kind of had a bias towards really paying attention to what the Air Force was doing or what Project Blue Book was doing or whatever. And for good reason, for a very good reason, because we, we, we want those documents out. We want more transparency from that. And that's been a 70 to 80 year process that is still ongoing, right? But then on the other hand, we're, we're thinking about it and we're like, gosh, there's probably a lot of people out there that are into weird stuff that get bummed out thinking about the military all the time. There just are, 
You know what I mean? There's millions of people out there that really don't like thinking about war. They don't like looking at aircraft carriers. They don't like thinking about this stuff. And one aspect here is that like, if we're going to, and this kind of gets back to what you were saying about having like light disagreements and you're absolutely right. Like we need to be able to have kind of difficult conversations. And one of those difficult conversations within ufology that I see is that people can't sometimes can't accept that a UFO show might not have been made for them. Yeah. That a UFO show might not have been made for them. I remember like when Demi Lovato's show came out and you know, whatever it's a Demi Lovato show, but like, she had, you know, an unexplained show, you know, of her own and like and of their own. And like, I'm sure that Demi's fans, some of them were really into that or people of that generation and stuff like that. And that's fine. And, you know, you see controversies around stuff like that. And like, I love that there are there would be a UFO show that's not built for me. Because you know what? I don't have time to watch everything in this space <laughs> anymore. <laughs> and like Kelly doesn't either. And, you know, you've got kids and you don't either. And so, but seeing new projects that are a little bit more tailor-made to different contingents or different audiences, or are specifically looking to broaden the conversation by bringing new people into the field. And that's really what we're trying to do here. We're, we're looking at, a, at an expanded audience and trying to kind of separate this, this Venn diagram that's been existing for 80 years, where you to be interested in UFOs or UAPs, you also have to hear about the Air Force all the time. We're not going to do that. It's interesting to hear you put a figure of 50,000 to 100,000 people in this community. Could be right, could be wrong, but I like that because I've said many times, too many folks who spend, this isn't a dig, all day on a certain social media site, be it Instagram, probably less so on there, but Facebook, Twitter, slash X, whatever you want to call it, um, they think that is the UFO conversation, and it's not. It's... I've said before, it's a long corridor of rooms with all different conversations happening, and it's just one little room with a very vocal minority all making a lot of noise. Most of the other rooms don't even know they're there because it's such a long corridor. And I think you're right that there are many documentaries that go out that one, you look at and go, I've seen all this before, interesting, but do you know what? And I'm sure Kelly feels the same here. I'm sure if Netflix put Encounters on, I watch it and go, is that for me? Probably not interested in the conversation i know a lot of this stuff um i think the polite things always to say these things are well produced i've used that term many times for documentaries i've i've not liked so well produced you know the production oh excellent and then two thumbs up i won't tell you what the rating is um and from there uh i've it's not for me but there are 200,000 people who stream that and stream it and watch it properly not you know a million that start it and don't stick with it maybe one percent of those goes and checks out ufo podcasts so maybe of those thousand or two thousand people a few hundred find kelly a few hundred find me a few hundred find ryan sprague and so on and even then they check out one episode and go nah this isn't this isn't for me this ufo stuff but some of them stick about some of them get into research and then you kind of grow the field that way and i think that's a really a good way to look at it especially the demi lovato stuff not my presentation not my style of thing but it drew in a very different audience who are interested in this topic in the same way that I don't know if I was going to say BTS. That's a really niche reference, isn't it? Some Korean pop band at their gig turns around with a million fans worldwide and says, we believe in UFOs. A good chunk of them go and find media, blogs, podcasts, you know, old school documentaries, whatever it might be. And it, it trickles down. Um, what what is your audience then and i suppose whatever one wants to come on on this first maybe kelly if you want to start what is your audience because you're going to have to it sounds like try and cater to the folks on let's just say ufo twitter who are looking for something to get their teeth into something to think about but kelly like you would say in your podcast you can't make something so hyper niche that we're all going oh my god this is so thought-provoking but your average person in the street spends one minute and goes I, I just can't get this i don't know what they're talking about so how are you planning to kind of tackle that problem that's a great question i mean i think something that we think about a lot is you know how do we and something that you know i've i've learned to really think about through my approach with my podcast is is you know how do i give people a framework 
to start with? Like, how do you, you kind of need to set up the framework that they probably already have that they've gotten through the media. You need to show them why that framework isn't quite working. And then you need to give them kind of a menu of options of other things that might be going on here. You know, and we don't have the answers. So that's really all we can do, right? Is give people kind of a menu of options. Mm. And I think that the people who are going to engage most and enjoy our project the most and feel like that this is for them are the people who really like to ask those questions, um, you know, and who are who are open minded um, and who are willing to kind of wade into the deep end of the phenomenon and ask the bigger questions. And with the understanding that, like, the answers are not going to be easy or obvious. And so, you know, I think that I have been surprised in a really positive way over the last few years with my podcast at the fact that I think maybe I can't, I do a lot less handholding now than I used to sort of realizing that I think in this culture that we're in right now, where everybody has the attention of the TikTok video that you assume that you're going to have to really walk people through it. But I think there's actually a, a hunger and among a certain contingent of people that I think is larger than we know um, to to kind of be challenged, you know, to, to have their brain, you know, to understand like 70% of something and then have to run it back and be like, well, what was that? Let me look at that again. Or, you know, to people who, you know, come across a question or a mystery like that, and then log on to Amazon and are like, what book can I read about this to learn more? Like what podcast can I listen to? And I think that for those people, for people who are like really wanting the details of like, you know, what's going on with disclosure and what's going on behind the scenes. Like that's not necessarily what we have to offer with our project. And there's a lot of projects that are great that are doing that. But for us, I think it's more, we're asking the bigger questions and kind of inviting people to go deeper into that mystery with us and to think alongside us about what might actually be going on here in a really kind of human and community centered way. Jay, do you want to add to that? Sure. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Kelly just said. And, you know, there's a tradition here where it's like, we want to be, we, it was really important to both of us to not treat people like they're stupid and to recognize that people are usually brighter than the kind of collective intelligence level that commercials and TV tend to project at. And so we're consciously thinking like, like we need more smart TV. Like there needs to be more smart TV out there. We're going to make some smart TV. And part of it is also like, but we, but we need to make smart TV. That's not boring. Like it's important to make smart TV. That's pretty exciting, not boring. And is pretty fun. So in that way, there's a great history, you know, within television and film with older projects, like say, what the bleep do we know? And things like that, where uh, a documentary projects that have some great visuals, some fun visuals, and really tackle brainy, like crazy, wild at wild it out concepts, um, while giving you like an audio and visual journey to experience. And that's that's partly what we're going to be doing here. And so I really enjoy that. I really enjoy the idea that we could be speaking on a, on a pretty high level, and at the end of the day, like picturing that there's going to be some guys that get home and uh you know slump down on the couch and smoke a bowl and watch our show at midnight you know what i mean like and that's awesome i think that's fantastic you know it takes all kinds and so you know coming at that kind of blend for an audience is going to be really important and so when i when i think like who is our audience i think it's a broad audience um but i think it's an, an audience that likes to explore that likes to be challenged and likes thinking about weird stuff you know and likes a good story that's what we're going for. One one thing I don't like to do on this podcast ever is uh, throw shit. But um, let's just humor me for a moment, okay? And let's sure. speak generally. What do you both not like to see in a UFO documentary or piece of film? I'll I'll start with mine. I've said this before. I hate I hate poor CGI. If you can't do it well, don't do it at all. Um, and I think, was it James Fox, the Virginia documentary, where there were more drawings and recreations in that respect than there was CGI, and it worked so much better. Don't show me a horrendous, you know, you know that little alien video of the little thing that dancing and does the weird noise online that my kids used to watch for ages. Uh, don't don't put something that really 
that bad on because that turns people off. So that kind of does it for me. Awful music. I get stock footage and stock music is is just the done thing in TV and documentary. But there's plenty of options out there these days. That really turns me off. Um, and celebrity talking heads who are just there for the sake of it when they don't really have an interest in the subject they're talking about. So there's three things right off the bat for me. So from your two professional points of view, what kind of stuff are, are major turnoffs for you making a UFO documentary that we're definitely not going to see in any on Talkalypse Productions? Kelly, you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, no, because we talk about this too, and we agree with a lot of those things. Um, you know, yep. I mentioned Mike Rubino, our film score composer. Yeah, we're really excited that we're that you there will be no cheesy sci-fi music in this, you know, in, in this documentary, um, which I'm really excited about. Um, I think visually something that we've talked about is just that like sometimes it looks like everyone is just like in a skiff or like being held hostage in the basement of the Pentagon or something. And and I think that some, you know, we tried to bring people kind of out of that into like a more human context, you know, and we we were really excited to be able to go down to that ranch in Texas and sort of get, you know, come really kind of sweeping, inspiring visuals of like nature, you know, and, and yeah. I think that that's bringing it into kind of a more human context, I think is really great. Um, we joke, we always joke about the like the like rusty swing noise that you hear mm. in, in docuseries. So you know it's spooky, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think if you have to tell people too much with cues like that, that it's um that that's a problem. And you know, something we talked a lot about too is I mean, I agree with you. You know, if if recreations are done, I think they need to be done in a really thoughtful way. And something that in particular has always bothered me, and I know Jay and I have talked about this a lot, is just that, you know. A lot of these stock footage sites where you might pull like a video of a UFO or something, they're being made like there are artists who are just like, this is part of their income stream and mm. they're putting something out and they're making it look cool. And they're probably basing it on, you know, not their own experience or other people's experiences, but like what they've seen in the in the movies, what they've seen in yeah. media. And so then we kind of have this like self-perpetuating cycle where we're kind of misrepresenting the experience itself by presenting the UFO as something it's not. And I'm passionate about that because I had actually been doing this work for over a year before I realized that I'd had this like, I knew I'd had one UFO encounter, but I realized I'd had this like second one where I saw something that didn't look anything like, and it was in broad daylight and it was like blurry and it didn't look like a craft in that like, something might be in it. You know what I mean? It, it didn't look like what I thought of as like a flying saucer, like a UFO. And so I didn't think of it as a UFO. And so I think it is like important that we be representing. And I think all of that is very innocuous. It's people just, we don't have real footage of UFOs. So you have to use something, right? And so what are you going to do? And so I think that's very, it's done very innocently, but I think that it ends up kind of subconsciously perpetuating some real misconceptions about the experience itself. And so I think that we're where we do dive into experience or narratives, we want to be as kind of faithful to the actual what that experience is actually like for somebody who's going through it um, and not lean on stock photography or videos that that aren't really based in reality. It's an interesting point about that perceptions reality. You know, you show people one thing in Hollywood and it becomes the thing. I'm pretty sure this fact is correct that um you know, people think frogs, if you ask someone to make a frog sound, they'll say ribbit. But there's only one frog on the planet that actually does ribbit. And it's a frog that's only found in Hollywood. So when they were filming <laughs> frogs for the first time ever, it was this one particular frog. But almost 99% of other frogs, it's like a croak. So ribbit isn't what frogs sound like other than a frog in Hollywood. And that's why everyone thinks frogs go ribbit. So if you present one thing as here's what a UFO is, here's what a UFO documentary should be. Here's what the music's like. Here's what the people who follow this are even like, which can be a, that's one of my other pet hates. Sometimes the types of folks who speak on camera um, and how that's presented, that can usually be done though in a detrimental way, deliberately. Um, so yeah, all that stuff can, uh, it sounds like you guys have considered all that anyway, but those are just some of my rants. Jay, what about yourself? Oh yeah. I mean, Kelly, Kelly hit the kind of greatest hits of, of ours to a large degree. Another one, um, I think, is leaning on the audio from like Gimbal and GoFast 
uh, and stuff like that. Or just like, whoa, got it. There's a whole fleet of them. Like, like we, I took I, that I, out in the podcast intro after a certain point because I had yeah. never heard that in anyone else's. And then yeah. I remember I got a few comments after like a year going, oh, another fucking podcast that's got the gimbal. And, and I was like, oh, are, are more people using this? I'm going to take it out. So, yeah, I was guilty no. of that. I was guilty. Well, but you were the ribbit. Uh, you were the, the, the innovator that found the ribbit and then you you pushed it out there and then everybody imitated it. That's yeah, what happened. I, yeah, that's, that's, that's all just the echo. Yeah, you're right. I shouted first. I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so, you know, there's that. Like, um, I mean, you know, some with some of the stuff, like the stereotypes are there for a reason and it's because they're awesome. And, you know, for example, with Gimbal and GoFast, people use them all the time because they you know they're they're so indicative of like december 2017 and like you know everybody finding ourselves in a new chapter with ufology makes mm -hmm. perfect sense we had another early rule and we might have to break it it depends we'll have to see how it goes but we had an early rule for the show that was just kind of a thought experiment but it was like what if there's a ufo that a ufo show that never shows an aircraft carrier once what if there's a ufo show that never ever shows an aircraft carrier can't be that? done can't be done. <laughs> right? We're finding that it might not be able to be done, actually. <laughs> We're finding that it's more challenging than you might think, partially because Alex Dietrich participated. And like the thing yeah. was there is that like I think one of the reasons we got Alex, like not just at my conference in December, but for the show, is that I I was introduced to her at Soul at the Soul Foundation Symposium. And uh and uh and she was like, Oh, you know, there's gonna be um we were talking and chatting and about how we were there to do a TV show. And she was like, oh, cool. Like, what are you covering? And I was like, well, I'll tell you one thing. We're not going to have an aircraft carrier. In it. And she just like lost her shit. She thought it was so funny. Like she was like doubled over. And like it was great because it was my first time meeting Alex Dietrich. And I had no idea whether that joke was going to land at all. Like it could have been a horrible idea to say that. Uh, but I did. And she thought it was really funny. And then we've gotten along great ever since. Um, but because she did participate in it, it has made it much more challenging for us to follow our own rules. Uh, yeah. But that can be okay too. You know, you have to like finding the show, especially in a, ser a situation like this where it's really the first series, it's the first season. You know, you kind of walk out and then you find your legs and you find where you're headed. And so there, there are aspects actually where what Kelly and I and Jordan thought the show was going to be back in like September, August, even November of last year has really shifted over the last months and partially just by having shared experience together and like going to Seoul and seeing what that was like and doing the Inquire Anomalous conference together in December or going down to this paranormal ranch in Texas, other situations like that. You know, it got a lot in, into our minds about like, gosh, you know, like I've been at this for a long time and it's still not quite what I thought it was. And like, where do we go from there? Oh, Gosh. So like as much as we were, we're kind of building the show to be a little bit of a mind screw for the viewer in a good way, it's also been like an amazing amount of like personal growth and thought for us as well. And I look and I, I look forward to continuing that. What kind of schedule are you looking at then for some kind of release? Kelly, do you want to handle that one? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we're very excited that we're going to be doing kind of a sneak peek preview of episode one at Contact in the Desert on May 31st. So it'll be on that Friday. I believe it's at 630. We're, we could not be more excited about that. And then a few people who are in the docuseries are going to be there with us, like, you know, Whitley Strieber and Paul H. Smith. And so it's going to be that's going to be really cool. So we're very excited about that. The actual show itself. I don't know, Jay, where are we? We've, we've updated our, our, it'll be out this summer, all three, all three episodes, probably like mid summer, I think it's fair to say. Yep. And it's three about hour long episodes is what we're looking at. There's going to be extra material and we're still trying to figure out whether we're going to play with bonus material or whether we're going to save it for, for a potential season two. But and do you, do you know yet how that's going to, how can I consume that? Is it, is it YouTube? Is it a paid platform? Is you trying to get it on streaming? Mm -hmm. uh, Apple TV and Prime Video are going to be two of the main dis distributors. We're looking for other world distributors, and that's one aspect. I've got a meeting about that actually tomorrow, and uh, we're going to continue in, in that vein. But yeah, it's going to be a, a small price point. It's going to be less than the cost of a pizza, less than the cost of a movie. 
to buy the whole season. So people can either, you know, pick up the first episode for a couple bucks and see whether it's their thing or not. Or, um, and if they do think it's their thing, then, then they can go and, and purchase the whole, the whole season. Um, we, we've done, we did a lot of, of research into like, you know, what, what seems fair, what seems, what seems doable, um, what's a good amount and things like that. And so I, I think people will be happily surprised about where we're at. Again, this is a self-funded situation. And one thing to think about along these lines, like with James Fox, for example, is that the reason, one of the reasons why you're buying James Fox's movie is that you're buying his independence for himself. Hmm. And that's like an incredibly important point that gets lost in the shuffle in a lot of situations because people will talk about grifting this, grifting that. Here, Kelly and I and you are participating in content online that we're going to throw up for free, right? And we do this week in, week out, month after month. And then, you know, once or twice a year, throwing something up for eight to, you know, half the price of a pizza um, can get so much of the community up in arms. But then there's everybody else that consumes Apple TV and Prime Video and all this stuff, and they don't think twice about it, right? And the deal is, is that that people should, I think, to Kelly's point earlier, we if this field, if this topic is as important as we think it is, if it's as important as the online community thinks it thinks it is, then it deserves to have a level of of sustenance and a level of backing and a level of heft and that can't happen if everybody's doing it for free right because then essentially we're just all street musicians with like an empty guitar case in front of us and like and like how can we be approaching this on such a huge level and doing something that's that touches on almost every field of science and social scientific inquiry um if we're all just kind of busking you know what I mean? Yeah. And even that is like considered poor taste or something like that. So in a situation like this, you know, we did get some independent funding, you know, um, from some backers, but it's a traditional investment strategy. And so, yeah. you know, we've promised them their money back and plus and plus some. And we want to be able to do that, too. We want that to be part of the story here that like that people with traditional investment backgrounds can put money into this space and they can make money back. That's important as well. And like, I'm okay with saying that because you know what? Like I'm a 45 year old adult, you know? Yeah. I'm a 45 year old adult and I don't care what some kid says about whether I whether we're punk rock or not. Like, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> I've been to thousands of punk shows and I guarantee that kid that I'm more punk than they are in, in most cases. And doing the shows like this is about as punk as you can get. It's about as DIY as you can get. And it's about yeah. as independent as you can get. Like we're not listening to any network's notes about what we're doing in the show. And we don't, and at the end of the day, we're not going to give a flying F what other people think about it. This is for us. And it's for, and it's for people to, to hear an kind of unadulterated, fresh, independent take that doesn't have a damn thing to do with what, the military industrial complex wants you to think yeah you're not forcing people to buy it you're not forcing people to watch it that they have to do it there's no taglines of you know rent this documentary today and you'll get the truth because this is we are hiding all the secrets on this i seen a cruise i got an email for recently advertising it you would find out the truth on the cruise and i was like don't don't do that that's just <laughs> that that just you know does a lot a lot more harm than good and do you know what people can go and do this stuff themselves and i would welcome anyone who wants to go and do their own research do their own work do their own podcast whatever it might be there's always a cost that comes along with it whether it's buying equipment paying for software subscriptions never mind the time that that goes into it depending how people might look at this and think it's shit and nothing oh, that's fine other people like it other people like it for free other people like supporting it kelly same with your stuff jay same when it comes to the documentary experience our group you don't have to like it don't have to do it it's the yep. same as me going to my local supermarket and going i'm not buying any of this food i can grow this myself they're going to go yeah you know what crack on you can grow potatoes and all that kind of stuff and tomatoes and veg and sustain yourself but do I want to go and get the better stuff that's done for me? Then yes. 
cool, so I go and buy a meal. But do you know what? Do you want the better meal? It's an extra £2.50, but it comes with this and this, and it's a little bit better cheese, and all got different tastes, you know, and value for money to one person is different to the next. So, yeah, I think if, if people want to support these things, more and more people understand that that's how the world works these days. Um, I, for one, I'm completely disgusted you're charging for it and I'll be pirating it as much as possible. Um, so it's not, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, Understood. it is what it is, yeah. yeah. And do you yeah, know what? Yeah. I think it's such a small minority of folks who do the whole grifter thing online. Really funny, I had I had one guy, I, I doubt he listens or watches. If he does, hello, you know. Um, had a go at me recently for putting a show out the day early and saying it was on Patreon, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it is with no adverts and with additional bonus content if people want to sign up on a two-week free trial. Um, but um, advertising my own stuff. I made the point, it comes out tomorrow and people jump in and try and defend me and stuff and they don't have to do that. The guy's bio, he had, here's my cash app if you want to keep me getting a little high. And I was like, mate, <laughs> you're not even producing content or anything for anyone back and you're like you know give me dollars to buy weed crack on best of luck to you i hope people do you know but don't have a go at me for doing this like jesus it yeah. was it was funny um but yeah no but that's Amazing. that's good to hear it's going to be out soon it's going to have some distribution um you mentioned james fox he got shafted by going with a company to do his uh, production for him he made almost no money from the phenomenon many folks will claim that to be the best the go to ufo documentary right now if you're introducing someone or you're 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 well versed in the topic he got nothing from that i mean like that's right tiny 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 amounts um so he'll he'll make more money hopefully and deserves to from his next because he puts in so much time and effort and goes away from his family for a month at a time to brazil uh, to do real real boots on the ground research so people like yourselves doing this as well i totally appreciate that and others do as well um Listen, let's dive into some listener questions, if you don't mind, uh, before we nice. end up running out of time. Uh, and Sounds then we'll good. get back to finish off on the conference stuff. Um, so Dave Smether sent in a couple of questions for each of you. Um, first off, for Kelly, and I'm going to read you the context to the question as well that he's given. So Dave says, I see many interpretations of The Others by Diana Pasulka, Donald Hoffman, as reworkings of the old Gnostic ideas of us all being part of the universal God consciousness, us having a spark of the divine within us and our salvation being through transcendence uh, to know God or the others. I worry that we are dressing up old religious or philosophical ideas to explain the phenomenon and how to interact with it. I worry because it just may have uh, better tech than can uh, that can manipulate reality than we think. Uh, and these old approaches may lead to a serious miscalculation of who and what the phenomenon is. Is this something, Kelly, you have considered? Yes, and I think that's a fantastic question. Um, I think it's I think it's complex because I think that we can see. I, I won't say that everyone believes this, but I'll say that that I tend to think that this is true, is that there is an aspect of this that we can, uh, the nature of at least some types, right, of anomalous experience that we can kind of map onto um, spiritual uh, experiences, sacred texts from thousands of years ago, and that sort of a thing. Um, and I think that that's important to notice and that it is it does bring in a potentially really important wrinkle to the conversation. At the same time, I don't, I see people kind of making the same mistake in two different directions. You know, one is saying like, oh, well then that means that like UFOs are literally angels or angels were literally just UFOs. And I think that like either one of those approaches is reductive and ends up kind of undermining the real question here. So there does seem to be something about this phenomenon that sparks um, spirituality and religiosity within people and that we have to consider that anomalous experiences are probably at the root of many of our religious movements throughout history. But, you know, I think as the question is kind of pointing to, we're also dealing with something where like if we take you know, uh, David Grush at his word, we've got physical craft in a lab somewhere. And, and, and so we have to ask larger questions. And so I think we just don't want to box ourselves in. I think it's important to notice these patterns, but to not let ourselves get locked in by either privileging some like past worldview or privileging our more like modern worldview. We need to hold both of those intention and, you know, continue to question what's happening. 
yeah, it's a fair point with the the angel stuff, and I've 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 made comments like that as well. But I'm not religious, and I don't know the answers to the UFO phenomenon. But you're trying to interpret an interpretation of an unknown using the interpretation of an unknown and saying, well, this is like this. Yeah, but was that like that? Yeah, we don't know. We're just going off of a book from two thousand years ago. But it's it gets a bit wacky, doesn't it? But yeah, no, I get that and appreciate that. Um, Jay, question for yourself from Dave. Uh, the unspoken consensus seems to be that if we want to get support from the politicians and public for disclosure, you need to stick to just crafts and bodies. If you talk about abductions and hybrids and talking to mantids at the same time, then however true these things are, it will harm, if not sink, efforts to get disclosure. So reluctantly, we must not talk about what experiencers have been through yet. How far does Jay agree with this? And is there another alternative to it? Yeah, thanks for that question. I appreciate it. Um, I think that solving the transparency problem, this this arguably 70, 80 year transparency problem, or arguably if you take in older texts and maybe what might be in like, according to people like Diana Basolka in like the Vatican secret library, for example, you know, we might be having a transparency issue that goes back many centuries. Um, and then it just got another layer of, of classification or various layers of classification once people like the Air Force got involved, right? Mm -hmm. Or the OSS or whatever. And so, you know, along those lines, I don't think that you solve a transparency conversation and problem by stifling and trying to hide other information. I don't think that those work together very well. Um, it's it's kind of like a do as I say, not as I do kind of situation, right? Um, if, if you are in a high school and you're getting reprimanded by the vice principal, but you know that everybody in your small town knows that this guy <laughs> gets a little loose on the weekends and has his own problems, you know what I mean? Like that's, you don't, you, you believe less than that person, right? And in a situation like that, you know, here, you know, we've we've got a problem where where we've been working with this with this idea of redaction for for many, many years. And this is this is kind of the concept that like, you know, documents for, that come out through like the Black Vault or otherwise through FOIA, you know, will have redactions in them. And we won't we don't we are not allowed that information. Right. But that process of redaction has also happened in say like spiritual texts like you're bringing up earlier hmm. it also happens with people that well-intentioned ufo researchers in the past that for a while you know there are there are these series of fads where it's like oh we're not going to talk about the occupants we're not going to talk about the pilots or if there's a case where an experiencer had more than one experience then an organization might throw their cases out because they were just deemed to be insane. And it's, it's impossible that more than one experience would happen with somebody. So I think that there's a level of just honesty and straightforwardness and vulnerability that, that needs to come out and can be applauded. And again, this is a situation I, I thoroughly believe that, that, you know, aspects like the Grush hearing or like Fravor going out in front of a small committee of congressmen and it making, you know, some, some local news organizations or some international news organizations, etc. You know, that has a level of effectiveness. And then there's another level of effectiveness that happens when we talk to each other just as people, yep. because what, what we're doing is, is we're relying on each other. And we're relying on a community rather than like basing things around power structures that have been built to suppress information and literally to extract money from us and oppress us. And I don't I don't personally think that that hiding like the more embarrassing aspects of myself, like when people when like this person talking about like mantis encounters or something like that. Yeah, there's a lot of inconvenient details among a lot of experiencers. And at the same time, like, there's a lot of personal growth that happens when we can start to have those conversations. And then people like, you know, Congress, Congress folks that people don't necessarily agree with, or people that might, you know, uh, go to work in a five sided building, 
you know, like those, like we don't have to have as much fear because we can build up with ourselves a better picture for ourselves of what's going on. Um, these, these are people that have had a hammer for decades and all they see are nails. And I like, I'm not a hammer wielder and I know a lot of other people aren't as well. Inconvenient details is a good name for one of the episodes of your uh, documentary series. If you're if you're stuck, uh, but yeah, um, question for both of you, uh, for both of you from it's either Smartian or Smartian. I think it's Smartian. Um, I'd like to ask, what is their best guess on the origin of the phenomenon? Short question, but a big one. Kelly, come to you first. Ah, oh, I. You know what's so funny is that I feel like the longer I'm in this field, the the harder that question becomes to answer. Um, yeah. I think in general at this point, I, it changes constantly, which I think is a good thing, but I'm leaning yeah. more towards something that is here, that is present. It doesn't mean that there's not an extraterrestrial component to it, but something that is either exists in some kind of a, a shadow biome or it, like some of these words end up being nonsensical when you really dive into them. All of them kind yeah. of come back to the same idea that it's, that it's something that's here, that it's something that that's local that I think both, I don't think we can deny that it doesn't want us to necessarily know that it's here or that it, that it hides from us. But I also suspect um, probably really influenced by, you know, my good friend, James Madden and his book, Unidentified Flying Hyperobject that this is also potentially something that like we're just not set up to deal with. I think we underestimate. We we tend to think of our own human perception and our five senses as being an objective window onto the world. And there's all kinds of evidence that that's not necessarily the case. And so it may be something that just kind of escapes our attention or slips through our defenses in some ways. So, and, and once again, all of that's just speculation and it doesn't necessarily point to a really clear origin. It's a hard it's it's the question right and i mm. think it's it's my favorite question but i don't know that i have a great answer i'm the same that that fluid opinion i think is really important in this that it doesn't mean you're right or wrong or you're you're a bullshit artist or or you've been caught out by someone because ah kelly once said in episode 12 that she believes it's extraterrestrial but now she's saying it's interdimensional well opinions can change and you should allow different opinions and ideas to come into your thinking and speaking to Jay and disagreeing with him on something, but going, actually, he mentioned this, and that that is a really good point, and I'm going to consider that. So that's going to change and shape my opinion now. Not to, now I'm going to think what Jay thinks, because he said this. No one should do that. No offence, Jay. But, you know, no one should completely flip their opinion based on one person's statement. But you should allow it to influence your own, if you want, and kind of have that kind of malleable flubber of an opinion, I suppose we can call it. Um, yes. Jay, what about yourself? Yeah, uh, similar to Kelly and similar to you. Like I, I don't pretend to have any answers here, but like I, I do, I do think about this kind of the this idea of the shadow biome and you know this other layer or this hidden realm that we don't necessarily see. And it does seem that from a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different cases, it would point at the idea that at least one, if not more than one form of NHI are taking advantage of proximity to us and taking advantage of some aspect where they can be so close to us, but completely unseen or undetectable. And they can blip in whenever they want and then blip back out again, almost as if they're coexisting in like on like a radio station that's just a few clicks away from where, where we're natively existing. Right. And if that's true, and it's it seems like there's there's something to that, then it could be like when, you know, when our ancestors discovered North America and they're like, whoa, it's a whole new land. You know, we did we come upon the shadow biome and, you know, people have talked about how nuclear nuclear proliferation and things like that may have like spurned some of the more recent waves mm -hmm. of sightings uh, at post-World War II, right? But, you know, similarly, like, what if we're on the cusp? People talk about, like, oh, what if you're on the cusp of destroying yourselves? What if you're on the cusp of AI, all this kind of stuff? Well, along those lines, what if we're also on the cusp of, like, discovering where this shadow biome is? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what if some, you know, some rogue operation that we don't, that is 
that prides itself on hidden science that we're not aware of? What if they've already found this shadow biome, right? But like, what if, you know, what if it is like it, coming upon North America for the first time? And you're like, oh my gosh, uh, we discovered it. It's just for us. And then the more you walk around, you're like, oh my gosh, there's these like Navajo people. Who are they? They're like, they're, they just like their, their structures look completely different. Like, I don't understand what they're saying. Like everything's foreign here. And then, oh my gosh, over here, there's the Sioux. There's another tribe. There another tribe entirely. And look at this frog down here that rivets. Like I've never seen that before. You know, we could be we could be exploring that realm for like for centuries and still not have a complete taxonomy of everything that might be living in one or more hidden realms along those lines. And that is kind of the best conceptualization that I can work with that helps keep it fresh in my mind without me landing on on something that that I can't demonstrably prove to be true. Just to ask you both to expand on it, because I like to try and think of things in simple ways that I can understand them. And Kelly, you're spot on when you say people use words, and I'm really guilty of this, that either don't really make sense or we don't quite have a meaning. You know, when you put quantum in front of everything uh, <laughs> to make it sound extra special, like I do a quantum podcast. Oh, how is that different to a podcast? Well, it just is, but it's not really. Um, the shadow biome stuff, the, the the closest way I can to really understand that would be something like Wakanda from the, the Marvel movies where it's here and it's a, it's a real thing, but we just can't see it. When I try to speak to people I work with and, you know, you mentioned to them, like, maybe something's here already. And they're like, well, where? And well, under the water, maybe. But what if it was physically here, but we just can't see it because of a better technology? Is that similar in your heads if you had to kind of visualize an artist rendition yeah a wakanda type scenario yeah yeah i think it could absolutely be something like that or you know or jay's example of kind of like the radio frequency that's just like a few clicks over um i think that's i think that something like that's definitely possible and i think that it could even be something like um i haven't gotten deep enough into it to know what i really think about it but i have been really intrigued by um, there's been kind of a lot of talk lately about this idea that plasma under certain conditions could potentially be intelligent. And so, you know, a, a huge portion, like over 90% of the universe is made up of plasma. And so it could be that, you know, we think of ourselves and our like physical world and our planet and just like our day to day lives as being kind of base reality and we assume that most of the universe operates more or less the way that we do but what if we're the weirdos you know what mm. i mean like what if we're what if this like 3d environment the physical body and all of that what if there's like a whole different way of being that actually is how most of the intelligence in the universe works and and we're the strange ones and so i mean i think that's that's possible also. And so, and, and it might even explain why it seems there seems to be so much curiosity about us and what we're doing, <laughs> doing down here. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways to think about it. And all of them are um, in some ways equally valid because we don't have great answers, right? That That's what I like to think in some way, shape or form, dreams are a part of something because, you know, that's an access to something else, somewhat totally different conversation for a different day. But I always wonder about that kind of element of things as well. And does that play into mm -hmm. consciousness and accessing, you know, very strange. Jay, what about yourself? Is it, yeah, Wakanda type thing. Sure. You know, I, I do think that, I think it's probably a both and situation because when we're talking about something like Wakanda, like I, it's very, it's something that's been very evocative lately is that, you know, in the last year I've, um, you know, I met Tim Gallaudet and mm. I, I hung out with, we, we met at Seoul. I'd been talking to him before that about the conference in December. And then out there, I got to meet some of his family. I met his mother, like wonderful people, incredible people. And then, you know, it, the conversation developed a little bit and, and then he produced this kind of amazing white paper that, yeah, that, um, uh, for the Seoul Foundation. And, you know, it's funny because if that paper would have come out 10 to 15 years ago, you know, people, it would have caused like aneurysms, not just in the, in among, you know, the Navy maybe, but like with, the, within ufology, I mean, it would have been absolutely great. And then here in 2024, people pay less attention to it because it's 13 pages long. 
and uh, their, you know, their ADD brains don't allow them to actually read uh, a PDF that's mo that's longer than their lease agreement. And that's yeah. totally okay. I get that. I understand that, and it's fine. But there are some amazing cases in there, and Tim gallaudet has been pointing out some amazing cases, and he's been using the public record to point at things. But then, you know, a lot of these, a lot of times with these retired personnel that have been aware of things, all they can do is point to the public record. So mm. when somebody like him points at a situation where he's like, you know, there's a public report of a joint U.S. Canadian naval exercise that came upon craft on the seabed and it appeared that there were you know non-human intelligences bodies outside the craft maybe attempting some to fix it or to adjust some piece of technology outside the craft and that it was filmed you know i pay attention to stuff like that i think yeah. that's fascinating and similarly he's been talking a lot about undersea anomalies that seem to be like arc that seem to be areas where there might even be architecture under mm -hmm. the sea or or kind of obscured architecture to the Wakanda point around Catalina Island and other situations like that. And I think that's fascinating, right? Because yeah. we've been talking for years, like, is there a base under sea? And a lot of people think that there, there might be multiple bases under sea or at least some kind of a portal or some kind of like a hiding spot. And I love that idea. It's tantalizing. What happens in Antarctica, you know? Like the crust, you know, and the surface of this planet is, people will point out all the time that yeah we we explore that but we still don't understand that completely mm -hmm. and then there's everything else and people like kevin canoes have pointed out like in his soul talk that that um it would be more likely often for like a space exploring civilization to to learn to hide under sea or to learn to go under the surface because in a lot of situations through space we don't like the that surface area is not as safe as ours is as yeah. you can as 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 evidenced by just the other planets in our solar system looking like they've been in a thousand school fights right so um yeah i think i think that all options should be on the table i want to find that other radio station maybe there's 20 other radio stations but i also want to find wakanda too for sure yeah that's fair enough so on that you make a good point when you mention and i'm going to totally forget what you just said there but it was a nice segue if I remembered it now. Um, oh, yeah. So the conversation around underwater bases sounds ridiculous, sounds absurd, sounds like a nonsense. I find it fascinating. But it's something that if I'm talking to, again, friends and work and we talk about UFOs and I try and do it a little bit differently, that can be a real turn off for them. You know, when you say, what if they're underwater and it gets a little bit, what, really, where? And it can be that they're not ready for that kind of conversation. So on that, multiple listeners on the, the Patreon kind of brought up a question and they had a little discussion off the back on it. I want to ask you both this question, and I think it's fair, um, especially for those who are still trying to come to terms with the experiencer side of the phenomenon. Um, but this applies to all aspects of the phenomenon, like I say. How do you go about personally trying to distinguish whether someone's experience is genuine, um, potentially not genuine either fabricated or the result of a psychosis mental health disorder because that's a real fine line to walk and i do think to both extremes one just poo-pooing everyone's experience or sighting you can't do that but on the other hand it's just as dangerous to go along and say everyone's sighting's genuine everyone's experience genuine because it's not going to be the case either way so i'll come to you first kelly if you want on that one yeah, I mean, this is a fantastic question and and I think a really, really important one. And, you know, the thing that I have come to in my own, because I struggled with this when I came to the field too, is that I've kind of gotten to a place where in general, I don't really try to assign any kind of a truth value to any particular story. Like I listen and I I tend to be a trusting person in that I believe that most people are communicating their experience honestly to the best of their ability. But there's a lot of complications with that. You know, so the, the phenomenon is very uh, tricky and it can mess with our perception. And even, you know, there's all kinds of cases where, you know, people saw 
multiple people at the same time saw something, but they saw something different, right? And so I think mm -hmm. that if we're getting too stuck on any individual person or any individual detail and trying to say, well, like this is definitely true and this absolutely happened as described, that we're kind of missing the boat because at the end of the day, like I, there's no way to really evaluate someone else's subjective experience. You know, like I could tell you today that I saw a kid bouncing a red ball and like, how do you verify? Like, how do you know I'm, I'm telling you the truth? Like you have no mechanism. You kind of like either believe me or you don't. Balance and so, of probability. Yeah. You know, maybe you did. Yeah. Why would you lie? That's, that's completely right. reasonable. Yeah. Totally. And, and so I think it's just a, you know, I, but, and so I think to kind of keep it open and, and I think what, where I have found a lot of value is in listening to a lot of different experiencers tell their mm -hmm. stories because I'm never going to be able to suss out whether or not any one individual is telling me the, the absolute unvarnished truth. Um, but I can over time, listen to a lot of star stories and start to see patterns emerge and start to see things that, that are in common. And that that's something that then I find value in that gives me not an answer, but it gives me a place to start asking better questions. And so I think that it's hard to stay in that ambiguous place. You know, I don't, I, I listen to people and I trust people, but that doesn't mean that like I am assigning a hard truth value to whether or not what they're telling me is like the absolute objective truth. And I, it, it's harder to stay in that ambiguous place, but I think that ultimately we get further in the conversation when we're, when we stay open-minded in that way. I've said before, just before I come to you, Jay, on the same question, my, um, my own sighting, the Ferris wheel type UFO is ridiculous. Right. I remember it vividly. It doesn't make sense. If someone told me that, um, five people saw it, it was in a really built up area, not in a field, not miles away from a town. It was right in the middle of a proper suburban area, loads of houses, playing fields, you know, football stadium, school, high rise buildings. All of that was there. Busy roads, reasonable time of the evening. It just sounds a nonsense, but that helps me when I hear other people's stories. I'm always going to have that inbuilt. Do I believe them myself? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but I have to attribute the whole. I don't know to it. There's a whole balance of probability. Like I say, that's just me. And I will assign a probability to things. But when it comes to experiences, sightings, as ridiculous as they might be, and this even goes as far as one of those documentaries I talk about where some women claim to have had alien eggs implanted inside of her and taken. And I find that a real hard stretch to believe. However, what's the difference to what I saw? Would she believe that? So, um, yeah, you have to keep that kind of level of open-mindedness about it. But Jay, uh, same question to yourself, mate. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate the question. It's a good question. And yeah, I, I think what Kelly said about patterns emerging from listening to more accounts is absolutely true. I mean, I've listened to thousands and thousands of people now through the experiencer group and outside of the experiencer group. And a lot of them in recent years in face-to-face -face situations, right? And, or in group support situations. And one interesting thing is that, you know, there are a lot, like in your case, Andy, where a lot of people, if they're coming to you and they're doing kind of a straight report of what they can recall about the situation and they don't edit out any inconvenient details, mm -hmm. it's usually, like, like yourself, it's usually weirder than what, you would want it to be yeah it's 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 there's an element that's vulnerable there's an element that's embarrassing there's an element that's challenging that's often the case and the thing is is that like those kinds of stories like like yours or like the one where kelly said like she didn't even think of it as a ufo because it didn't look like a structured craft mm -hmm. you know those aren't stories that are going to make people rich those yeah. aren't stories that are going to make you popular. Those aren't it's going to be stories that necessarily go over well at the at the Christmas dinner table, yeah. you know, with family or something like that. And so in situations like that, I tend to listen more, you know, um, I think, you know, Hal put off Jacques Vallée and many other people have had a variation of saying, like, if if 
if somebody comes to you with a UFO story and it makes sense, don't believe them, you know? And I, I think that there's something to that where I do come to, come to situations and conversations from a position of trust and openness and wanting to listen without judgment. And, you know, I, that's an important thing within the vetted community of the experiencer group, for example, but it is a vetted community. And there are, there are, you know, volunteers and members that, that go through people's uh, application to, 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 to join the group. And sometimes somebody will, will, will write in and um, I don't, I don't want to assign a value to it, but like mm -hmm. there's, there are, there are situations where you recognize that people are in a position of high stress or, or having um, severe mental health issues that need to be addressed. And I know from personal experience that I can speak to other experiencers and I can even speak to experiencers that have like everybody does some, some mental, you know, challenges, some anxiety, maybe some depression situations mm -hmm. like this. There is a vast gray area when it comes to, are you an experiencer or are you just having a mental health issue? You know, because if you've had, an, if you've had serious anomalous experiences, there's a, damn good chance that you've also had some some mental challenges along mm -hmm. with that just in terms of like how to reconcile that with day-to-day -day life so you know that's to say that i would i would say like maybe that it's a very small amount of people that approach me or approach our community from a position where they're they're either clearly having a mental health emergency um that does happen but even less so are people that seem like they're lying for the purposes of infiltration mm -hmm. or, or for whatever reason. Um, I think that partly that's because if you're approaching a community that's known to have a bunch of like people that um, uh, have been around other experiencers quite a lot yeah. or people that might even, you know, be gifted with like precognitive dreams or like, uh, you know, extended sense perception in some cases, like serial liars don't tend to approach communities like that for whatever reason. And I think that's great. I think that's fantastic. You know, having a couple yeah. like having a couple like wonderful um, old psychics around tends to help things out quite a bit. And do I have to believe those psychics every single time? Nah, no, sure. But but I, I do. I think that openness and communication is important. And to, to the point of, of the original question, you know, th there are going to be a lot of science, uh, scientists that study, say, like, that are more in the physical sciences, that would more appreciate having a metal material, metal material in their hands, that are never going to listen to a case like mine or your situation or Kelly's situation. And that's fine, because there isn't some cool, you know, metal material that came out of the situation. But then there are folks like anthropologists that are fascinated by situations like this or psych or psychologists or psychiatrists or people that really study social sciences and social studies that, you know, there's there's a lot of terrain there that can and is getting covered and will be covered in the future um, where, you know, we won't have to be using our intuition and just our sense of the connective nodes between experiences to get at the bigger pictures, you know, like we're working on professionalizing and kind of expanding this field and working on the stigma issue so that other people can come in from other disciplines and give us more tools to be able to vet um, maybe better than, than we have in the past. And I think it's such a big topic. It invites such a wide range of people. And you've got your folks who like your nuts and bolts, your folks who like your spiritual side, your your folks coming into this brand new who don't even know what they like yet, you know, to Kelly's point, who are just like, what is this? And, you know, where am I going to land on it? I'm spinning the bottle and seeing where I go. And I think when I've done some of the listener call-in shows, the, some of the comments online can be, you know, oh, that caller who said about their experience with X, Y, and Z, that, that was a lot of crap. That never happened. That was nonsense. But you get so many more or even the same amount. I wouldn't attribute false values to it, but people who will get in touch and say, you know, that really strange sighting, I had something really similar. Or, you know, when someone woke up and had that kind of odd being in their, their bedroom, but it done this. 
people said that was bullshit, but actually I had something really similar happen to me. And it's that whole thing of patterns tell stories you've both alluded to and hello to Klaus and Garrett. I'm, I'm stealing their podcast name for a second there. But it's true, and I think there's something to that. So it's a very fair answer, I think, from, from both of you. So thank you. Um, last couple of questions before we wrap up, folks. I appreciate your time. Uh, question from Cams for Kelly. Since you released the episode about your personal experiences, how has that affected your podcasting, having been a respected podcaster in the field for a while now? Um, Cams also asks, do you plan on having multiple documentary series like the one you're planning now, or is it a one and done? I imagine it's not a one and done, but I'll let you both answer that. Yes, thank you. Um, it's been an incredible experience, actually. And, um, you know, it, Jay is somebody who is fielding a lot of those calls from me before I uh, released the episode, because I it was it felt like a huge leap to kind of come out of the closet in that way. And it's a process that he's been through very publicly also. And um, he's like, it's going to be fine. And it, and it, and it was fine. Um, I think that you know, I don't claim to have any answers. I tried to just speak as like openly as I could about what happened and the process that I went through of kind of coming to terms with it and thinking through what it might have been and being really open about the fact that I don't know what it was and that I still don't know what it was. Um, and what's been really beautiful about it is like, yeah, I've gotten a couple emails. I've gotten a couple reviews where people were like, this show used to be good, but now it's crap because, you know, she went off the deep end. And like, that's fine. You know, like you're talking about earlier, like not everything is for everyone. And like if my if where I'm at right now, me speaking authentically, you know, from from my heart, from my own experience, if that's not resonating with somebody and that like that's okay. You know what I mean? Like there's a whole world, a whole internet full of fantastic content that someone can go and find something that does speak to them. And so like, I'm really comfortable with that. Um, but for the most part, what I did get was hundreds, maybe even over a thousand at this point, if I'm being honest, emails, DMs, messages, comments from people who said, you know, thank you so much for saying that something similar happened to me. And and, and that has been such a beautiful thing because it, when I went through that experience, my immediate reaction after it happened was profound grief. Like I started sobbing because I felt like this was something that was going to build a wall between me and the rest of the world and between me and the people that I love. And that, and I, and if the, the isolation of it and that I wasn't gonna be able to talk about it and the fear that I was crazy was so overwhelming. And I, I'll never forget what that felt like. It was like one of the saddest moments of my life. And so to kind of have gone through this process and then to come forward with it and to have so many people be like, yes, that happened to me too. So like, and realizing that that fear that I had, that this thing would make me alone was like unfounded. And, and that was, that was a really special thing. And to know that hopefully I helped a few other people realize that they also aren't alone and that there is life after something like that and you can integrate it and that it can actually be a really beautiful thing. And so um, it's been a fantastic experience and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad I did it and I'm grateful to Jay and some of my other experience or friends who kind of held my hand through that process as I, as I stepped forward. So. Um, if you haven't, and you're listening to this now or watching it and you haven't left a review of Kelly's or my own or anyone else's, take a few minutes, leave a five-star review, go and find Graham Rendell's books, find some authors and leave them reviews because it does make a difference and help out. I did get a one-star review the other day and I've had quite a few of these where it's, for example, this is a five-star podcast, but I don't like the outro. Change that and I'll leave a five-star review. One star. <laughs> and it's, like, it's like, come on, you could have dropped me an email. Uh but yeah, it's each to their own. But yeah, they do help right. out. Oh, and um, I should answer the other part of the question. I apologize. I was just going to say, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, the, uh, there is more coming. And I apologize because I really thought it would all be out by now. But, um, you know, in a lot of ways, I think docuseries, like ha making a docuseries is like having a baby where like if you really knew how much work it was before you did it, <laughs> um, you may you'd be a little more scared going in, but you don't necessarily know um, what you're getting into. So I've just been, we have just been 
up to our eyeballs and work with the docu series in the best way possible. I'm having the time of my life, and I'm so proud of what we're working on. But um, there are two more parts to that series. The story gets crazier. It involves um, another experiencer who I didn't know at the time, who my life became very tied to for a time, and. Um, I can't wait to share that story. And those two parts will be coming out. It's just like really impossible to say right now exactly when that will happen, but it's coming. And as soon as I can get it out there, I'll get it out there. I just really want to do it justice. So I've got to, I've got to take things kind of one, one step at a time. Um, final listener question. I had had a lot more sent in. Some of them you've both answered in the body of the, the interview and stuff as well, but we'll keep some for another time. Um, but this one to both of you from Timothy. Uh, my question is, since having your own experiences and then discovering other folks within the community sharing your experiences, do you believe that this is some kind of spiritual movement, a possible birthing of a new religiosity, or is it some sort of disclosure being brought forward by a higher intelligence? or something completely different? Jay, we'll come at you first on that one. Sure, yeah. Uh, I appreciate the question. It's a thoughtful question. Um, I believe, I'm not, like, I, I think the, the best formulation is I'm not exactly sure what to believe. Just, just on, on the, at the outset. I do think, you know, to be perfectly frank, I think that so many people have been approached in such specific ways uh, from the perspective of of, of non-human intelligence encounters, close encounters, that there does seem to be a kind of grassroots door knocking campaign on the from the perspective of at least one other form of intelligence. And I think that part of that door knocking campaign isn't even necessarily intentional. You know, sometimes people get a glimpse of something that they're probably not supposed to see, right? And so I am not sure how concerted of an effort that is on the part of the wide variety of NHI that people encounter. And of course, towards the idea of what Kelly was talking about earlier, there are, there are tricksters and there are elements where, where five people might be in a room and they might see something appear or present very differently to each of them. So, you know, when it comes down to, well, what's the message or what are they trying to get across or something like that? It seems that we're getting approached by a wide range of intelligences or even a wide range within several different cultures. Um, because if somebody, if somebody, you know, and knocked on the door, if you answered the door and, you know, it was Graham or it was, or it was you, Andy or Kelly, or, you know, or Klaus or anybody else from, from the online community, they would come to you with a different, with a different approach, no matter what they were trying to do. Right. And, and that kind of tracks with how people, receive some of these encounters. And when it comes down to the spiritual and religious question, you know, we don't know exactly, we don't know how to wrap our heads or our, or our arms or our hearts around the, the specific encounters that happen. But one thing that I've been amazed by is how people choose to process them and how people can like approach what's happened to them and then find ways to grow right ways to grow in terms of like how they look at the world how they look at their loved ones around them how they look at themselves and there is a strong spiritual component to that and that can happen in all sorts of situations and maybe one of the uncomfortable and inconvenient truths in this is that we that you don't have to be a member of any particular religion to find yourself in a challenging situation and find spiritual growth from it. So that could happen if you fall off a cliff. It could happen if you almost get hit by a car. It could be hap it could happen if you get struck by lightning or maybe it happens if you see a ghost as well. Yeah. Kelly, do you want to follow that answer? Yeah, I think that's a great answer. Um I agree with all of that and I think I think it's complicated. Be it's complicated. I'll, I'll say it, it's so hard sometimes to talk about spirituality, and in some ways, I need to like talk about it from like my like what what I think because I think it's so subjective. But it's something that's a challenge for me 
is that this, for me, this has been a spiritual experience. And I would characterize what I've undergone through the past few years since the experience that I had described in my podcast as kind of a spiritual awakening. And it has transformed me. It has transformed how I think about myself and my purpose in the world and how we think about the value and purpose of other human beings. And it it is a, and I'm profoundly grateful for it. It's been a very, very positive experience. And I've also had so many, many experiences over the fast, last few years. And like Jay has been central to many of them where like, it seems as though not only is that happening for me, but that I'm meeting so many other people for whom they have kind of been flipped on in that way in the last few years. And it seems like we have work to do together. And it seems like we come together through kind of stunning synchronicities and coincidences that like don't seem to make sense. And then even weirder stuff happens. Like, like I've had experiences where I've had extraordinarily vivid dreams about something very specific happening to Jay. And then I wake up and it's Jay calling me on the phone to tell me that thing that I just dreamed. And like that, those aren't experiences that I had before. And so it's hard for me in the, in the flow of my everyday life to deny that there's something that at least my experience of it has been something spiritual that's connected me to something that I, in my own understanding would characterize as maybe even divine, but it's, but at the same time, there's a part of me that's a, that's still the skeptic. And, and there's a part of me that questions like, what even is spirituality? And what is that impulse that we have? And what is it about the anomalous that kind of like wakes us up and re-engages us in certain ways and redirects our entire lives? Because like I've walked away, my, my career was everything to me. And and I walked away from it after 15 years and just walked away. And now to, to start a UFO podcast, like everyone in my life thought that was like absolutely insane. And it sounded insane and I couldn't justify it any other way. And yet here I am and my entire life has changed. And so, you know, I'm, I'm both in it and living it and grateful for it. While also there's always like this tiny piece of my brain that's outside of it being like, what is this? Like, what is happening? And I never want to lose that part, actually. I think it's really important to never like fully drink the Kool-Aid and to always kind of keep that one part of yourself open and to, to, to radical possibility and mystery. Because the truth is, I don't know what's going on here. And my own feelings about it and my own interpretations of it are very vulnerable and could be knocked over at any time by a different data point that suggested otherwise. And so I really try to like live in that space. I think I've learned through life to never get too high or too low with anything, try and sit in the middle all the time. And yeah, it's got its ups, it's got its downs, but here we are. Um, but listen, you've both been fantastic with your time. Let's finish off talking about uh, this year's Contact in the Desert. Kelly, you mentioned it earlier. It is happening this year from May 30th till June 3rd at the Renaissance Esmeralda Resort and Spa in Indian Wells, California. The event is in person and being live streamed as well. Tickets at contactinthedesert.com. If you want to uh, kick us off, Jay, uh, what's your role at the event this year? Oh, my gosh. Well, <laughs> they do a great job of, of throwing people at all sorts of stuff at Contact in the Desert. And so I'm going to be, like I did last year, I'm going to be running... Uh, what they're calling this year the experiencer group sessions where we're going to have as many as 40 people or so uh in a circle it's not really for for people to just watch it's for people to participate in and it's for people to be able to tell tell their stories without being judged and to be able to share and compare notes i'll be doing a session like that each day at contact in the desert i'm also going to be participating uh with kelly uh um, on a, a podcast episode. Uh, I'll let her talk about that. Um, I'm going to be leading a panel discussion for contact experiencers on Sunday. That's on Sunday morning, bright and early in the Crystal Ballroom. Uh, it's a great space. Um, I led a panel there last year and I'm excited to be back doing that uh, with guests like Whitley Strieber and Travis Walton. Um, that'll be a, a real wild time. I'm, I'm, thrilled that Whitley has, you know, really become kind of a mentor and friend 
uh, to people like me and Kelly, uh, but it'll be my first time meeting Travis and I'm really looking forward to that. That'll be awesome. And then I'll let Kelly talk about what's happening uh, again on Friday night, which she touched on earlier. Yes. So we are going to be doing the premiere of the beyond. There'll be a sneak peek of episode one, which we're so excited about. Jay and I just spent this whole last week um, at my place in Cleveland, really banging that out. And uh, we're, it's, it's, can't wait to show you guys what we've been working on. I think it's really special. I know I'm biased, but I think it's really special. Um, so that'll be on Friday night. We're so excited about that. Um, I will also be hosting what I'm told is the first ever uh, women in ufology panel um, with you know names like Linda Moulton Howe and Yvonne Smith and a bunch of other great um, researchers and people in the field. So um, I'm really honored to have that position. And I'm, I really can't wait for that panel. I think it's I think it's really exciting and it's kind of a dream come true to be able to do that. Um, I also will be doing a lecture of my own um, on kind of like deconstructing, you know, the UFO lore um, that a lot of which is coming out of learnings in my own perspective shift that's come through, you know, as Jay was alluding to earlier, kind of the on the ground, you know, boots on the ground nature of the work that we've been doing and, and how it's, how my thinking has really evolved through making the docu-series. And so I'm excited to share that. Um, and then as also he said, we're, we're also going to be recording for the first time ever a live episode of the UFO rabbit hole, um, on Friday as well. And Jay will be joining me for that. So it's going to be an insanely busy weekend. Um, I'm so excited to be doing it and I think it's going to be just like a fantastic time. And, um, yeah, I, I've been really looking forward to it. Well, I'm sure that'd be a lot of fun, whether live streamed or in person, if you can get there. I've said before, I wish I could be out there. Um, it's a little bit further away for me uh, for me than most folks, um, but it'll be a lot of fun in getting to meet people like yourselves in person. Uh, I know Jay has said, do not approach him. Uh, it's 50 quid per autograph and uh, yeah, no <laughs> picture. No. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great to be, go up and talk to folks at these events and get to meet people and the little avatars you've spoken to for years suddenly come up and say, hi, I'm such and such. And you get to kind of share that kind of few minutes, which is always nice. And uh, personally for me, this isn't again, blowing smoke up anyone. Um, I'm glad to see you're both doing an event like this because I've said for too many years, too many, especially big events have dined out on the same names, the same faces and not always for me, just opinion, personally, some not so credible ones that haven't moved the conversation forward have basically been stuck in the same spot, you know, treading water. Um, and it's nice to see not even necessarily younger folks, but people with fresh ideas, fresh opinions, fresh voices, be able to kind of change and, and mold the conversation. Cause I think it definitely helps. Some people might not like what you've got to say. Some people might not like what you do, but others will be hearing it for the first time and you can change a lot of different viewpoints in that way. So it's always, always a good thing for me. Thank you. We're excited awesome. about it. Yeah, Bless and you're you. going to have to make it out to one of these, Andy, because we, we have to hang out, man. I, I think we're long overdue. Yeah, I, I'm going to try my best. Uh, my wife has told me, I think I've got permission at one point this year to get out, so I'll have to pick and choose. Um, but I'll do my best. Um, yeah. Uh, and Quite Anomalous, got anything planned for this year? Oh, um, yeah, though, I'm I for my own sanity, I'm going to choose not to think about it until we deliver the show. Okay. After that, um, yeah, uh, there there's been some loose plans. I've gotten some things in mind. Um, I've talked to a couple people, but uh, but uh, we'll be able to talk about that further further down the line this year. Absolutely, looking forward to that. Awesome. Well, listen, go check out Experience Our Group if that is something you feel you will benefit from. Uh, link will be in the description. Kelly, you don't need to advertise, but uh, the UFO Rabbit Hole podcast links will also be in the description as well. If you've came over from Kelly's podcast to listen to Kelly on here, hello. Nice to meet you. Hopefully you've understood the accent. And uh, best of luck to both of you and hopefully have you both back on very, very soon. Thanks so much, Andy. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure, Andy. Thanks so much.